Hi, welcome to another episode of Alta Heron. Tonight we've got a very interesting episode, we hope, for you, where we're going to be looking at something that Hans and I have discussed for some time, which is putting the treatise, putting the source material that we look at into the context, into the history that really makes up the HEMA. And now I'm going to ask Hans just to introduce tonight's guest. Yes, I will. Uh, hi, and tonight we will have Roman Buchank with us, and we will talk about Joachim Meyer and uh, his world. Uh, but first, uh, Roman, it's really, really cool to have you with us. How are you? Are you okay? Hi, good evening. I'm, I'm great, thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's really lovely to be with you guys. Roman, can you uh, first like uh, introduce yourself a little bit, where, where you are based and how long you've been training? And... Okay, um, I'm from Slovenia and, um, well, I'm based in Slovenia. Uh, we have a really nice club here, but now that I'm father of small children, I um, cannot be actively involved with the club as much as I would like to. Um, but uh, just this year, I think uh, I will have to commemorate my 20th anniversary of picking the sword up for the first time. Wow. So, uh, yeah. I started with the reenactment, and then that led to, uh, to to other spheres, into other directions, and now I'm, I'm with Yauhi um, Meyer. Okay, okay. So yeah, we we're gonna focus on Meyer and his work today tonight. Uh, so can you just give us a brief overview of uh, of Meyer's treatise, when it was written, for whom it was written, and the weapons cover? Can you start with that? Okay, um, we are talking about the uh, the second half of the 16th century. Uh, Maya was uh, from Strasbourg, um, and uh, we know about few of his of his treatises. Um, they cover well. We think we they cover the last four uh, uh, decades of the 16th century. Uh, he died in 1571, but then the first reprint was uh, of his Grundliche Beschreibung was in the 1600. Um, he is actually one of the um, one of the big big guys on the scene, on the martial arts scene, and uh, we are still discovering uh, all the horizons, all the broadness of, of the horizons. But uh, he seems to cover um, a lot of uh, more than one weapon, more than one approach to the fighting. Uh, the most known to our community is the Grundliche Beschreibung, which means the complete. Um, uh, three ties about uh, the knightly art of fighting, about the uh, Ritterliche uh, Kunst, and uh, we sort of place him at the end of the German classical fencing tradition, the the uh, Kunst of Fechten. Um, what is interesting is, uh, for example, Hans, in your neighborhood there is uh, the Lund, and uh, you go there and you can check out the Lund manuscript. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, a translation into English will be published, I think, this year in, in the States. And uh, we already have an English uh, translation of this Grundliche Beschreibung. And so I think somebody is doing something about the Rostock manuscript, which is, I think, his last uh, treatise that we are aware of. Plus, there is at least one that is lost in time. It was still around in the 19th century. We have a description of it. Uh, and Joachim Meyer, in his works, mentioned about how he will write and uh, would write on other things, but we are not sure whether he managed to do that or not. Um, what is really uh, fascinating about the guy is that, um, just briefly, his, his bio is really interesting, but uh, the punchline is at the end. Uh, he's from Basel originally. And then he moved to Strasbourg, which was not um, so well, which was common at the time. The two, two, the two towns were really um, uh, communicating to each other a lot. But uh, and he married in Strasbourg, and he married for uh, citizenship. So Joachim Meyer was basically a migrant who married for for, for his passport, so he could uh, get the citizen uh, status. Uh, he had his craft. He was uh, in, in cutlery. He was a cutler. And then he organized Fechtschulen, and he taught a lot of, um, he had really distinguished clients. Now, and this is where the story goes on, is that he finally manages to land a good job with the Duke of Mecklenburg in the north of Germany. He travels there, but he dies of 
we think cold. We, we, we have this in our uh, biography. It was researched by Olivier Dupuis. Um, and the fact is, he was just over 30 years old. Joachim Maia, not Olivier. So uh, can you imagine that? Uh, being such a grandiose guy, a martial artist, organizing factual and teaching um, war, teaching actually warring nobility, and the nobility who was actually fighting uh, around, uh, and then you die and you're just over 13. Uh, over 30. Mm. That's uh, fascinating, isn't it? Mm. Can we just put this in context as well? When Joachim Meyer is actually um, practicing and expanding, uh, we, we we're talking kind of a, uh, about the time when maybe the Bolognese school is maybe just past what we, as we look back at it, see as its height. So we're certainly after Morocco. Um, it's probably when Dalagokia is, is, is working. So you've got a lot of the, um, you're sort of 50 minutes, you've got, you've got a gripper um, coming out of the Roman school. So we're seeing the beginning of, um, well, we're seeing, seeing sort of the, 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 the great height of the, what we now know, what we now consider to be the side sword area, moving towards the rapier area. And meanwhile, in Spain, we've got Carranza, I guess, starting out, um, possibly a little bit before as well. So to, to put him in context, we're, we're seeing this sort of, um, he, he, he's part of the upsurge of Renaissance martial arts at this time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he lives in very interesting times, and I don't know, maybe we will cover that in, in a minute. Now, if I just go back to the treatises, the original question, um, the Gründliche Beschreibung, um, in there it covers the longsword, and it's the first weapon. And it's the weapon to start with. He actually says, says something along those lines. Um, Joachim Meyer's uh, treatise is a work of art. There is a bit of history, a bit of tradition explained, and there is a lot of pedagogical and didactical material. So we have a, let's say, a complete system handed down to a student, and Joachim Meyer actually uh, refers that to his readers, says, I'm putting this book together so that you can practice even when you don't have a teacher next to uh, practicing with you at that time, and I'm giving it, uh, giving the knowledge, handing the knowledge down to you so that you have a system. And he goes through longsword, then he goes to Dusak, uh, one-handed weapon, very um, Germanic, very Central European, who, uh, which uh, was very popular in the next centuries, uh, up to quite late. And uh, then we have the rapier, the side sword, but Joachim I calls it the rapier. And then there's another branch of nice conversation. Why does it have that name? And Joachim I even says, no, this is not a Germanic weapon. This is not something that we Germans should use, uh, do, use but we should learn about it. And I will give you two reasons for it. And this is what it's. I think Joachim Meyer was a. Uh, he was a man that I would like to sit down with, have beer, and and and, and just uh, joke because he says the two reasons is are um, the first reason is let's broaden our horizons. Yeah, mm. let's not just stick to what we know, to what our neighbors know. Let's just see what the world knows. Mm. And the second reason is. There are a lot of foreigners coming to our lands, and we should beat them with their own weapon. <laughs> uh, yeah, foreigners coming in. Ooh. Um, okay, now I'm being nasty. Uh, well, to jump in on, on that point, there one thing that was very interesting was um, you and I did a workshop in in Switzerland uh, a couple of years ago, which was basically comparing. Um, I think I was sticking very much to Dalgokia, and you were, you were doing Maya, and. Um, the, the fascination to me was how much Maya thoroughly understood this, we'll call it an Italian weapon for, uh, to, 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 to generalize massively here. But he, he, he certainly had, he was, uh, the impression I have is a man who is thoroughly versed not only in his own art, but in the art of, of um, other people as well, these foreigners, as you say. Yes, I, I do get the same impression. And uh, especially the connection with Italy, this is now, this was uh, a real genuine highway, not only of people traveling uh, north and south. Um, if we have the Netherlands in the north and Italy in the south, and Strasbourg is in the middle somewhere, um, uh, we also have this fluctuation of, of, of ideas, of concepts. 
And again, the interesting time of the 16th century, actually, we, we're talking about an explosion of uh, European horizons, not just to the New World, which uh, uh, is a certain element, but also about big changes, uh, not just religious, but also uh, on the social and, and economic, and I mean, even in Marshall's, uh, Marshall scale, um, for example, um, if I just finish with the we weapons and then um, I'll just go yes. to, to this interesting aspect, is the side sword is followed by the dagger, so dagger is still there and wrestling is still there. Not as much as in the medieval treatises, but it's still there, it's still being used, it's st Maya still tells us what to do with it and uh, the final weapon, um, uh, uh, the final weapons are the Pole arms, so the the pikes, the halberd, um, the quarter stuff, and what I like about Maya being a teacher is, in for example, in the side sword he would say, oh, when you fight someone using the gerade versatzung, the uh, straight parrying, and I told you all about straight parrying in the dusak section, so if you want to learn about it, go and study the dusak section. So he actually. Is he is not isolating the weapons one from another. He's combining them into a system, and that is something that is really, really good for us today, for 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 modern practitioners of the art, um, that we have this general overview. We are not just filling a, in a, a niche, our own pigeonhole. Um, maybe there's a the lesson in in it for us to broaden our horizons as well, not just stick to one weapon that we like, but maybe sometimes venture into another one, just to to learn something, maybe just as a mirror. Uh, mm. For example, a lot of nice stuff about the longsword, about um, the line in the longsword, I, I learned from doing the quarter stuff. Mm. Yes, and, and for, for example, uh, Hans's uh, uh, countryman, uh, Roger Norling, would tell, could tell us more about it, mm. about the quarter stuff and Maya, but this is what I want to say, this fluctuation of knowledge from one cover to the to the last page of the Maya's book is just amazing. And uh, I don't think that Kunst's Fechtens has anything like that, at least to our knowledge, in medieval and, and early 16th century stuff. So this guy was clever. Mm. It's really clever. I don't want to get too much into the detail of, of the treatise, because obviously we, we, we're talking yeah. around the treatise, but um, for a modern practitioner, um, and naturally, we're always saying if you're a, a modern practitioner, you should really try to, to get a teacher first of all and join the club and so on. But how accessible would you say this treatise is to a, a modern student? Today? Yes. Today is, this is amazing. The whole thing, actually the, the 1570 uh, version and the 1600 version are both online for free in original. So it's just a, just, just a scan. And then we have uh, an, a really nice translation to English, done by by Jeffrey uh, Forgang or Forgang, I yes, can't remember. Forgang, yeah. Forgang, yeah. And, or we have a uh, uh, really neatly stuff done by Alex Kiermaier in German. So I mean, the thing is around. It's very accessible, and it's there, and it's neatly done. So. Um, but I mean, in, in so far as comprehension, uh, I mean, obviously any, any student is going to enter into interpretation, but to pick it up and the understanding, the reading of it, how clear is it or is it very um, obscure in certain areas? Uh, how, how would you rate it? Um, I would rate it as, as very clear. However, uh, it is written in its own time, so we still have to bridge this distance. I mean, it's, uh, the treatise is not written in the 16th century for a 21st century reader. There are yeah. there, there are things to bridge, uh, but it's not it's nothing like, for example, my own experience with uh, Talhofer <laughs> or someone <laughs> like that. Uh, that's uh, I found my really really uh, user friendly. When I started with it, it was a. a, a an attempt of translation in English. It was an online. Can't remember who's, who's done it. It was nice. It was a first step, but it was the first version, and um, it opened up a lot of uh, horizons. So, um, if I sound like I'm a Maya fan, it's probably because <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
would you say would you say that there is a if you would say like this is the core theme this is the philosophy to the whole treatise can you kind of sum that up in a in a couple of uh, seconds? what is what is the core theme with 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 Meyer's treatise um, the core is it leans a lot I mean, it's practically all of it it just leans on the kunst des it it does not develop any new approach that would deviate from that very something that we call uh, or used to call German fighting you know you, you go in you you want to 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 get the initiative you you're going for the four you um, uh, you know about pairing but you know why pairing well you, you prefer to, to 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 attack if I just um, speak bluntly basically mm -hmm. um, um, the movements the uh, the trail from this Kunstdesfektens, the medieval one, is clear. Maya does not invent new stuff. He's not a, a, a um, an avant-garde in this in this way. He's really, really traditional fighter, but he explains it in a new way. He explains it in, for his time, modern way. Um, so uh, the philosophy is. When you go, when you decide to fight, perhaps this is my interpretation. When you decide to fight, um, don't don't fiddle about. Just mm. just do it. Do what it what it takes. Um, something. Uh, do whatever the market needs. Is one of the English translations of, of one of his sentences. Um, even though, for example, if we look at someone fighting, trying to, to fight or fighting in my style, we see a lot of movements. Uh, like unnecessary movements and uh, people ask why then they are not more direct why do they uh, use three tempos instead of one for example three blows instead of one uh, but then we need to remember that um, Maya takes us from the very approach of the fighting to the point when you actually step away from the person you've just beaten so he's not talking just about a technique in the middle. He's talking. Uh, he's taking us through the whole process from closing the distance to actually, st as I say, s stepping away. So mm -hmm. it's a much longer uh, uh, a clip than we would fight in medieval treatises. Most of them. Uh, so this is why it seems that it's taking longer time. And uh, one other thing is, of course. Uh, uh, if we just take uh, longsword, for example, uh, and we compare it with medieval times, yes, I, I'm pretty sure that Lichtenau was a true revolutionary in a sense. Yeah? But from his time and Tamaya's time, there was a lot, a, quite a, a couple of centuries and a bit more past. So the approach to the fighting also evolved. So Maya was not fighting an opponent from the 14th, 15th century, he was fighting someone from 16th century who knew about that evolution. So uh, closing the lines, attacking from different sides, I'm not saying it did not exist in the Middle Ages, Maya just explains it and takes his time doing that. So this I think is the not necessarily the philosophy which is straightforward, it's basic, it's, it's there to use, you're not prancing about, you're not showing off you fight when you need to fight, but uh, he just uses words, uses example, explanation, and um, maybe two or three exercises for one specific principle and so on. So this is, in a nutshell, this would be a description, I think, as I see it. Okay. okay. Should, we, so, should we move on from the treatise and move into Meyer himself then uh, for a while? Uh, can you tell us maybe you, you, you already told us a little bit about him is wh where he came from and what he did uh, can you go a little deeper into that who was Joachim Meyer okay um, first of all I, I do have to say that uh, there is a site Hroar site by, by managed by by Roger Norling and there's a lot of stuff about mm -hmm. Maya from texts to to images to uh, concepts uh, and 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 so on background so for everyone who's interested they can spend a lot of uh, entertaining hours reading through through text um, now there is an image of Joachim Meyer fighting with side sword and dagger and um, Rob that's image one 
in, in the document. Yeah. OK. For example, this is someone that we or some people think this might actually be uh, Joachim himself. Um, throughout his Grundliche Beschreibung, there are people who look like this and um, doing various important, uh, performing various important functions like being a, a, some sort of a, a teacher, holding a staff and so on and so on, and we think this might be the, the man himself. And um, as you can see from the picture, maybe this is just romanticizing a bit, but this guy is um, a fighter and uh, the picture does justice to someone who is a, a martial artist who is involved in his time. Um, the picture depicts him, the image depicts him uh, as a Renaissance man. You, you see the attire is a typical, this uh, uh, called Renaissance Roman armor and, and the use of modern weapons. But it's, it's all based in tradition. Maya talks about Germans a lot. He uses this particular word Germans. We Germans do this, we Germans do that, this is how we've done it before and this is how we should do it now and so on and so on. Um, he even explains why he thinks about the martial art in a knightly way. And if we just think about the time, in the 16th century we have the uh, late medieval fascination with the Arthurian cycles Rob, in, in England, you would have Sir Arthur Mallory and his La Mort d'Arthur and so on, the 15th century about, and then the Burgundian court and so on and so on. The magic was a bit gone by then uh, for this particular um, uh, aspect of, my, of chivalry, of knighthood. Actually, in Germany, what we have, uh, the knights would uh, be uh, members of a social caste by then. Landowners, military people, and the virtue, hey, I mean, what's a virtue when there's economy involved, right? Now, I have to say, there's a disclaimer to things that I say, I'm using very, very simplified terms. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are exceptions, and yes, there are other rules, but I'm just trying to picture in a, in a uh, brief and, and wide strokes. And this guy comes in and says, okay, now what we should do is we should teach and learn the noble art of fighting. So we should avoid being gluttonous. We should avoid being. Uh, we should avoid skirmishes. We should avoid doing stuff that other people do, swashbuckling in inns and taverns, and do nasty stuff and just being morally corrupted. So this guy, who is not, as far as we know, uh, he does not belong to the upper class. He does not belong to someone who would be born in moral proper background. He calls for. Um, better self-appreciation of a martial artist. Uh, I just hope I'm not buying too much into this stuff. Maybe it was also a very good PR. But uh, later I will talk about uh, the, the person whom this treatise was dedicated to and uh, we'll see if that person actually appreciated the chivalry as we think he should. But Maya, I think, believed that martial arts should be uh, you uh, should be taught and learned in a more morally cleansed environment. So the, the intention should be cleansed a bit, perhaps in order to be able to retain even, even better control. Um, if uh, for, uh, What I'm talking about is uh, if a morally better person is using the martial art instead of being guided by uh, corrupted intentions, uh, theft, murder, whatever, just the, 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 the list is long, then this martial art is perhaps uh, more worthy of doing. I'm, now, I'm saying interesting that, on this to um, jump in on um, the, the, the historical context around it. Um, I know we're going to talk about his, his, um, his social environmental um, context on, on this time, um, but do you feel that moralistic attitude is coming from the social environment because you have got you know, you've got the religious wars going on in, in France at that time, you are just after the great period of the German mercenary, after the Italian wars, and you're just pre the Dutch wars, and of course the Turks are always around. Is, is, is this him, uh, and you've got the religious milieu as well, is, is, is this him reacting to his environment or drawing on it from that, that he's 
he's, he's seeking some worth from it because of all the violence he's seeing around him? Yes, uh, there is. I mean, he stands on violent ground. Mm. We see his, his time actually see violence coming all the way to the doorstep. Mm. The 16th century brings violence to a uh, uh, very brutal violence to uh, na a neighbor fighting the other neighbor. Um, and uh, the, the religious wars and so on, but uh, which in German lands also have a lot to do with econom economy. If we see that, uh, for example, the princes of the land who declare themselves Lutheran or Calvinist or whatever, then they felt justified to seize very large properties from monasteries, convents, and uh, bishoprics and so on and so on. So the, the, the economy factor is in the 16th century is really strong um, and it finances a lot of wars as well. And we also see why, uh, on the other hand, the imperial the, the imperial politics, which is still Catholic, and the Habsburgs, they have always been Catholic, but they don't always agree with the Pope on this. So we have a, a big mess in mm -hmm. a way. But there is also one, this is, this is the, rea this could be in a way, re Maya's reaction to the times. But there is also another element, which is proactive element. Um, the Protestantism, as a, maybe I should, I should call it Reformation rather than Protestantism. Mm. Reformation is actually a very, very distinguished and um, defined political movement because it is almost a synonym for independence, independence from empire, independence from a certain political system. It gives opportunity to be more autonomous, to be even independent. And this is an idea that was pursued by the Protestant princes who wanted to carve their own territory, to become sovereigns of their own territory. And this is a, uh, if, if, you, if you take a look at the history of the German part of the empire, the Holy Roman Empire, and you see all those thieves and states and this and that, this division that goes to microscopical levels has something to do with that. And while Meyer says, uh, let us be morally more, let us stand morally firm, this is, could be also a sign of, um, this is, let's build our future. Now, this is the time when we can really build our future. I'm not saying he was trying to uh, uh, win an independent state. I'm just saying that we can, well, some of us from our part of the world, uh, I remember 25 years ago, you know, the, the, uh, uh, when Yugoslavia went apart and I, I could hear those ideas. And I still remember mm. some people, not all of them, talking in a similar sense, you know, getting, okay, now uh, there's the opportunity, let us build our future, let's make it this, let's make it that, let's make, make it worthwhile. I don't know if that was Maya's way, I'm just saying that it resonates a bit. Well, I think I we need to that. perhaps. Um, I think perhaps we need to un understand the world in which Maya lives in 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 the terms of the Holy Roman Empire, because there's a lot of misconception yeah. about that. And I think um, just 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 very quickly, as I understand it, you you what you have is a a, a series of obligations and legal entities, be they city states, princedoms, fiefs, or whatever, that go down to really quite a very low level. That's within this entity that is entitled a Holy Roman Empire, which has electors, the, the, the emperor is elected, although the Habsburgs are ruling it. Um, so whilst you have this split in religion, with predominantly Lutherism at, the, at this time, with Calvinism growing in, in some ways, and Catholicism, they are nonetheless still working predominantly within a legal framework of the, of the empire. So the empire shouldn't be seen as this continual warring state through which I, I, I think Maya's trying to elevate himself at the time, but there, there's factionalization and, and, and difficulties going on because of the, the intricacies of the empire, the politics that are involved in it. Is that a fair enough assessment? Yeah, yeah, and even further, I mean, once you think you, for example, now that uh, we who are uh, an amateur historians, uh, uh, we, when we think we sort of grasp one idea, for example, we take the religious part. Yeah, that is the this is the most uh, sort of a predominant th theme um, in the 16th century. Say, aha, okay, so we need something build up in this Catholic dogmatic sort of way, and then somebody somebody just started a process 
And yeah, okay, we see the differences, we see where this is leading. But then along the line, we cannot ignore things, for example, that um, people who should be enemies because of the religious base, which uh, strikes the very, the, the, the deepest core of their being as a religion, actually for religi religious people, it should, right? It just sort of tells you what you are, when you are, and what you should be. Um, then you see that those people who should be enemies, in some cases, they're actually not only allies, but they might even be friends. And you say, hold on, what's going on? And then you say, okay, then we look at the eco economic uh, history of it. You see, aha, okay, there were ridiculously rich Catholic establishment, which have grown from centuries of uh, uh, through the Middle Ages, and German lands were really taxed in a way. For example, if if you see the the demands, the financial demands of of uh, Roman papacy, and how much money went from Germanic lands to to the south, you can see that people from Germany were a bit angry. Yeah? I mean, all that. Why are we paying our taxes to? someone have over there who should be uh, morally just and so on so on but we know that Rome is actually plunged into it's it's a new Babylon yeah and we, we read that in the late 15th century early 16th century stuff and you say okay so it's rich against the poor again well no it's not because then you see another mixtures and then you involve the <clears throat> sorry then you involve the foreign policy you say okay Catholics should stick together but then you see that uh, French king and uh, the emperor Charles, so Francis and, and Charles, they were s really hewing each other in the back all the time. Actually, yeah. Francis went even so far, and he was a Catholic, mind you, that he, uh, he, he created an alliance mm -hmm. with the Turkish yes. Sultan against the, against the uh, empire. Um, for example, in 1543, a Turkish fleet of, th I think it was about 30,000 Turkish sailors, actually occupied Toulon. Toulon, that was, uh, it, it was famous in, from the Napoleonic Wars, for example, for example. And French king asked all the inhabitants of Toulon, French people, to just get out of the town of their own houses for the winter so that the Turks can occupy it. And the Toulon Cathedral served as a mosque for one whole winter. It was, it went so far. Um, so, so what we're saying then is, is uh, just, just to move this on really, what we've got is, is we've got a Europe which is not as we would envisage it, as perhaps we envisage it, envisage it too much from now. We, we have the French machinations in some ways and, and also some really hideous religious warfare, um, all religious warfare is hideous but particularly brutal throughout the 16th century. Then you've got um, uh, Italy, which is, um, you know, perhaps at this period less, uh, not, not suffering as much as it had earlier in that century, but still very much split. The Spanish are there in good force. And then you've got this curious uh, place where Maya is, is, is based in, in the Holy Roman Empire, which is, is this sort of um, strange political entity. Um, yeah. do, uh, do, do you feel the, um, what, what, sorry, to move on from this, uh, what's the influence of the Turks on the Holy Roman Empire as well, which would have affected Maya? Because, of course, this is the bastion um, in, I suppose, in the Balkan areas, as we know now, and also um, in, in Hungary, against the Turks. So you, you've got this sort of, this, this entity of the Holy Roman Empire having to deal with um, its European allies, but then it's got the, the monster as well, the Turkish invasion coming towards them. Yeah, the, uh, it was the beginning of the Balkan front, so to speak, very close to Vienna. Uh, it happened a lot of, in Hungary, and then it evolved in the, in the, in the, in the centuries to, to follow. But uh, for Maya, um, let's just say, for example, that the, the first political union of the Protestant lords, Protestant princes and, and high nobility, so the movers and shakers, so to speak, um, which ended in 1547, uh, so a bit, a bit before Maya actually worked as a as a, as a fencer, uh, and uh, Emperor Charles defeated it. It was the Schmalkalden League. Um, the Turkish Sultan already sent letters over there, and it was a constant diplomatic communication between the Protestant princes and 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 um, Istanbul. 
And it was interestingly enough, this, it is also a ground why the Protestant princes and the Protestant countries, so, uh, uh, cons in consequence, decided not to interfere with the Mediterranean fight so much. So you have big battles like Lepanto, like all the stuff. When the Christendom in Europe and the world as we know it were threatened, and the Protestants said, well, well, no. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, we, we really have to look at Europe as some big, complex, multidimensional chessboard, mm -hmm. not just draw it in a couple of colors. Let's say, okay, the Protestants are blue and, and the Catholic are red, and this is the political and factual uh, map of Europe. Um, and, and to carry on from that, it's interesting to me that the, the Protestants as well, we, we, we can't say that they were always pro-Turkish because in, in, in Hungary and so on, they're actually joining their, their, their back in the emperor. Um, so basically we're saying it's a mess, aren't we? It's a mess. <laughs> it's, uh, the, I mean, it is, uh, also tells you a lot that um, there is not one singular idea that would connect that would unite various provinces, various circum sets of circumstances uh, throughout Europe. A Protestant in Hungary would have, perhaps would have even somewhat different interests than a Protestant in the Netherlands or in England or in Scandinavia at the time. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, if we realize what that is, we may get a clearer picture. And then Strasbourg, the Mayas town, um, interestingly enough, in the, uh, the early 16th century, the first half, it was in basically they were talking to the Swiss Federation whether they should not join the Swiss Federation. Um, but then Strasbourg said no, because we, they, they, something along the lines, we need to take care of our own protection within the empire, mm. not outside. <laughs> and it tells you a lot about, as you mentioned before, the legal systems and, and other traditions and the trade, of course. Um, Strasbourg was really, really dependent on trade, on, on traffic, on a lot of people passing by and passing through. Uh, and for Maya, uh, I think he met those people who were passing through. And this is also uh, someone with a keen eye, with keen ears and uh, functioning brain. You can get a lot of ideas and you can actually um, combine them. Does this show in, in the martial aspect? Does this show in, in different martial traditions? Yes, Maya actually states that in his uh, Rostock manuscript. That, um, where he, th there are a lot of rapier in there, a lot of side sword, and he actually lists all the traditions that he put into his treatise, and they go from Italian, Neapol Neapolitanian, uh, Spanish, French, German. I mean, it's, it's a lot. I mean, and he was, it, it was possible for him to do it, either by his own traveling or by people who traveled to Strasbourg and around. Okay, it should, so be, mess, basically. Uh, it should be more, uh, it's pretty interesting that you mentioned his treatise again now, that we go back into that. Let, can we talk a little bit more about that? And you mentioned, uh, uh, let, let's talk about the symbolism in his work. Um, because it's filled with shape of animals and positions and numbers and can you go into that and talk a little bit what what is that yeah that is that is an interesting thing um, and uh, it's it's an anecdote it was uh, uh, you know, it, as I said before I have small children and uh, when they're tucked in um, I can then go and read and do stuff on my computer and then when I get a bit tired looking at the graphics of, of uh, uh, various positions and, and techniques and so on. And then I start looking what else is there in the graphics. Uh, I'm, I'm just referring to the Mayas Grundliche Beschreibung. Very rich, very striking graphics in detail and in composition and in, in their message. Well, and then I notice there's a lot of other stuff. And um, I would just like to quote uh, a friend of mine who is an art historian, uh, Noah Charney. And in one of his books, he says that symbolism, which is very important in Middle Ages, but was actually evolved, uh, erupted in the art of Northern Renaissance. And this is exactly the place and the time of Joachim Maas Street mm -hmm. For example, if I refer us to uh, the, the first graphic of the, of the longsword, yeah. and, uh, and we see that's um, 
we believe that's Joachim Meyer in the middle and that two guys with the long sword and we see the division of the swordsman and, and the sword explained. This is where he explains the strong of the blade, weak of the blade and so on and so forth. So forth. Mm. But then there's there are other stuff in, in the picture as well. There, there are other people in the, it has depth, yeah? And then we notice, and this is something that I found funny at first, but then I started looking at it. There are a couple of dogs uh, on the ground, yeah, just 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 uh, behind Joachim Meyer. And then we, we have a monkey in there as well. We, we have a parrot, the fruit. And we can say, yeah, well, that's something you would put for decoration to, to see that it's a... Uh, an aristocratic environment. You see, the the pillar there is Corinthian. The the uh, the facets on the, on on the on the ceiling in the background. The people dining. They're obviously well off. Yes, uh, but can we just remember that we're talking about a uh, a Lutheran or Calvinist environment? The guy this particular treatise was dedicated to was a Calvinist. How? do the Calvinists respond to lavish decoration? That's one question that I, I just asked myself that. Mm. And then I went and I actually searched in, in various, um, in, through various sources, hey, what, what, what did a dog mean in medieval and, and then Renaissance as a, as a symbol? What, what was the dog? And its uh, predominant meaning was loyalty. Yeah. And monkey, for example, its predominant meaning was um, uh, a very, <laughs> to speak in nice terms, a very short attention span. Uh, so focus on something that is instantly gratifying rather than focusing on something that's really important and sticking with it. Um, and the parrot, well, that's, that's a bit theological anyway. So, and we say, okay, so they're dogs, loyalty, are they fighting, are they playing? And there's a nice story behind that. Um, Joach Johann Casimir, the guy this uh, book was dedicated to, was a younger brother of, um, of a prince, of an, of an, of an elector of, of Rheinland, of Pfalz. And the older brother was a Lutheran and the younger brother was a Calvinist. And we say, well, yeah, well, what's the difference? Well, uh, in the Maya's time, at that time, the younger Calvinist brother was... Uh, once wanted to fight a lot of wars, so to speak. Let me let me just do the film script. The younger one wants to fight uh, the wars, and the older uh, the the older one wants to um, be a statesman. He needs stability, political stability. And the younger one, uh, who was left without the title, actually managed to persuade his father, the Friedrich III, the original elector, to carve out a piece of territory and give it its own princedom, so that the, the, the younger one would also have a, a, a title, uh, which would give him, legal, in legal terms, gives him a bit more freedom, a bit, more, a bit longer lever to do his stuff. So those dogs, are they then fighting or are they playing? Is Maya then, as a, this symbol of authority between them with his staff, as a judge in a teacher pose, in a pose of a, what is he, a, a judge, philosopher, teacher, what is he, does he explain, does he measure, what does he do, or does he bring two brothers of the same blood together in a way? And the monkey over there behind the pillar, if you can see it, mm -hmm. there's uh, uh, the people where they're dining and behind the pillar on the right there's a monkey hiding behind the pillar but looking at the two mm -hmm. brothers. Um, What's what's it doing? Is it wasting time on watching uh, the play, or is 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 it watching a political game? What what does it do there? So you see, all those questions um, popped up to my head when I was watching this this thing, and um, we have several others. For example, in uh, the dog is a recurring uh, 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 symbol, and a bit later we will see. Um, a funny symbol of a dog in, in the Maya's uh, manuscript. Uh, we also have, um, in the rapier section, we have a, a fawn, a beautiful, a beautiful one, which is a symbol for uh, all-seeing entity, something that sees all, 
and that is proud, that is um, uh, decorated in valor, and so on, so on. Um, and in Germany, in Middle Ages, it also means uh, all seeing eyes of, of the church. Okay, so we have another political. Line. So, what I'm trying to say is, I'm not going, I'm not 100% uh, convinced that there is, um, that all those symbols tell some hidden political messages, agendas. I'm just saying that they are there for the reasons. I mean, would you, as a fencing master who had to borrow the money to get the book published, would you waste money on a graphic designer or on, on an illustrator just for the heck of it? I wouldn't. Well, perhaps more importantly, I doubt that these, this, this symbology would be lost on anyone at that particular time. I mean, certainly the, the, the younger Calvinist and the Lutheran uh, brothers would, is a, an analogy for a lot of uh, the history of the period. Yeah, so I think it does tell a story for the people of the time, for the uh, end. I mean, if you're trying to dedicate a book to someone, you want to show them in a, in a nice light, yes. so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, can we see a few more of these? Uh, pictures? Yeah. 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 There's an interesting one. Can you also uh, tell us a little bit who illustrated the, the free text? Because there's, there's a lot of illustrations in it, there's a big, big manual. Who, but who did the work? Who, who did the illustrations? Yeah, there were the, uh, this um, a workshop from, from Strasbourg, um, the Stimmer family. Uh, in that previous uh, image, we saw the initials of Hans Christopher Stimmer, uh, HCS, written there. And there was, uh, I think there were brothers or brother and, and son. On, uh, uh, I think Roger Norling really explained it much better in his article, can't really remember. So it was the, uh, the workshop. Uh, there's a, 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 a graphic long sword, um, the D1. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a link there. So yes, uh, I think we're looking at it now, aren't we? Yeah, we have it now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's just funny if you look at it, um, you would see there are certain numbers in there, but they're just sort of they're just uh, uh, scattered around. For example, one number is if you see uh, the uh, image to the right in front, which is in the stance of a Vexler. Mm. There's number that there's something that resembles number seven uh, in between his legs, and then his counterpart, which is in something called Schlüssel key, has the Roman number two there. And you say, well, yeah, whatever. Okay, it may be a smudge. It may be something. Yes, it could be. But on the other hand, we have uh, Heinrichus Agrippa from earlier 16th century who wrote nice treatises about numbers, not a magical way, but numbers that that. Uh, tells you about um, proportions and stuff and so on and something like Vitruvian men, maybe even in metaphysical sense, and he has a lot of the same numbers. Mm -hmm. Meyer wants to tell us something about the sort of uh, 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 certain positions. Is there a, uh, a geometry, fencing geometry? Is there a philosophical geometry behind it? I don't know. I just see the numbers, I think. Yeah? Um, so this is uh, another kind of, of symbolism that I that I uh, noticed, especially with that one with connection to con with connection with Agrippa, uh, Heinrichus Agrippa, not the the, the Italian one. Mm -hmm. So and uh, interesting mm -hmm. enough is we also have a, a portrait of uh, Agrippa, this Heinrichus Agrippa, who was done by Tobias Stimmer from the same mm -hmm. workshop who did the Myers book. <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, it's. Coincidence, I guess. Strasbourg. It was a small town, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's something. Okay. Okay. So we are looking now at Strasbourg, at approximately, approximately the time from from Joachim Meyer, and we see a well situated town, very well taken care of. Uh, it could defend itself. It has had a militia. It had a system. It, it had a good governance, and it was keen. On prosperity basically we have a, a modern time of its age it was not a time it was not a, a town somewhere in uh, the margins of happening it was uh, a metropolis in, in a way and what is interesting for the martial artists is that the factual that were uh, organized there were basically international. Uh, Olivier Dupuis, years ago, he actually uh, forwarded me a very interesting data that uh, in 1569, 
a Fechtmeister from a part that is now modern Slovenia and a Freifechter in 1579 from Krain, which is probably just kilometers away from where I live, they traveled and fought in Strasbourg Fechtschule. And once again, once one was a Fechtmeister, which means a master of fighting, and the other one was a Freifechter. Uh, so, which tells me a lot. You know, people, maybe, maybe do we have a glimpse of our modern traveling when we travel from one a uh, HEMA event to another HEMA event and uh, people go to fight in, in, in Nordic League and so on and so forth and go and, and do their degree in Italy and stuff like that. But that was Strasbourg for fighting. And uh, we know that Joachim Meyer, he organized five Fechtschulen uh, and he, as I said before, he, he was teaching there and uh, some of his pupils were of, of, of the highest nobility, like uh, von Solms, uh, whom um, his Lund manuscript was dedicated to in the 1560s. Uh, but when, as we're talking about the towns, there is an interesting topography which uh, that I noticed again in, in, in uh, Maya's uh, images of the Grudliche Beschreibung. And it's really interesting what things pop in one's field of vision when one is tired. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, for example, the rapier image D, what is interesting is that rapier is situated in a very lavish surrounding. It's, you can see the decorations, the pillars, and this and that. It's similar to the, to the uh, quarter stuff and, and Holwood section, but this one particular, this image, if you look in the background, there is something that resembles a tower, and there is something that is, uh, resembles a... Uh, something tall and pointy. Well, I don't know if this is true or am I just fantasizing a lot and just giving way to my imagination, but um, this actually exists, this topography exists in Rome. Uh, this pointy stuff uh, could be uh, the Pyramid of Cestius and the tower next to it is uh, Porta San Paolo uh, what is even more interesting is the pyramid is on the right hand side on the graphics, which means, and like here, the photography, it was taken from, wi taken from within the walls of Rome. So this is within the historical Rome. Mm -hmm. And we say, hold on, did, wh wh what do you mean? There are people fighting in, in a palace in Rome, uh, uh, sort of Germanic, what's going on? I mean, did Maya have a, a hold a, a factual there? No, but we did have Lutherans fighting a lot on one particular occasion in Rome, and they fought in a in the Apostolic Palace, in the Pope's Palace. Uh, it was in the fifth in 1527. It is the Great Sack of Rome. Hmm. We have the imperial troops who weren't get who didn't get their pay and they just uh, tore themselves off the leash and they attacked Rome and they plundered, plundered the city and, and basically devastated it. Well, a part of the imperial troops were also the von Frunsberg Landsknechten who were Lutheran. And even today, if you go to the Apostolic Palace, which is now part of the Vatican Museums, you would see on one uh, Raffaello's fresco, um, you would see... Uh, 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 graffiti, carved graffiti, Luther. So, and you say, so actually, basically, you, you have that. Now, why that uh, uh, episode was important to Meyer, if that is the episode, I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but there is a fighting in a palace in Rome, and it did take place. And there is another um, another graphic. You see the upper, the upper right corner, there's the, an old man in a sort of uh, wrapped in a cloak, what it seems, and he has a beard, and he has a funny little hat. Now, um, open the image 9A. This is Pope Clement VII, where, who was yes. Pope when uh, the sack of Rome, when, when it took place. And uh, this was the first Pope who actually grew beard in sort of a lamentation of that particular uh, event. Um, uh, the canon law, canon, the canon law actually forbids uh, the priests to grow beards, uh, but he did it. And then, uh, up until the 1700s, uh, popes 
more than 20 of them actually wore beards. Um, so if I was a Protestant saying, ha ha, we sacked Rome, and, uh, and I want to take, uh, want to sort of make a joke out of the Pope, I would depict uh, a funny, grumpy man with this particular kind of wear, headwear wearing a beard. Now, is there a, a, a lesson, a martial lesson in it? Um, not particularly the, with, a, with, a, with a man you know, with a beard, but there are six figures in front of him fighting. So for martial artists, I think this is also a great image. What about the people he's socializing with, or working with, or traveling with? Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you can, we can talk about that, and then, then perhaps to round off, we can talk about what happens to, to Maya at the end of his life. Okay. Um, well, if we just take a look at, for example, we start with the people whom he dedicated his treatises to, because he mentions them by name. And this is a pretty good start to, um, for us to to, to take in this journey. For example, I mentioned the Gründliche Beschreibung and the younger brother, uh, jo uh, Johann Kazimir von Falsimmern, um, a very renowned family, um, you know, the, the, the high nobility. Um, dedication is in place, so uh, it's like today when you write a book and you'd like a foreword to be written by the, an authority of the field, it helps your book. Uh, so we can understand the intention. And uh, I, I mentioned what this guy was. I would just like to add that Joachim Kazimir von Falz was a ferocious Calvinist, unlike his older brother, who was a Lutheran. And uh, Joachim Kazimir actually fought in France for Huguenots. This is the time of dynastic war, <coughs> of dynastic, dynastic wars between Valois and the Guise, for example. And then we have the future Henri IV of, from, from the Pyrenees. It was just years before the, the terrible slaughter of Paris in, in St. Bartholomew, Bartholomew's Night that, that happened later in the 16th century. But still, you know, it was building it. And so you have a, this guy crossing the Rhine, crossing the border, going and fighting for the Huguenot, for the Protestant anti-Catholic faction. So uh, Joachim Kazimir was not uh, just a noble. This was a noble, noble guy in a in a saddle of a war horse. Someone who knew his warfare and who knew what works and what doesn't work. Um, then we have uh, I, I mentioned the Lund manuscript before. It was dedicated to Otto, uh, Count to, uh, von Solms, uh, and if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Otto was a bit. Uh, Otto was a bit of a of a traveler, a diplomat. He traveled around. In the 1560s, he visited Strasbourg. He studied in at the University of Tübingen and then Wittenberg. And he went to Savoy. And in this 1570, he went to Geneva, which takes him to Besançon and Paris. And he even spent a, a season in England. And uh, uh, I, I think I have a source that says that he was particularly liked. Uh, the English court. So we have a well-traveled person who, again, knew what the politics were like, who knew what, uh, 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 who, who could take the pulse of his time. So Joachim Meyer couldn't just sell him anything in, uh, say, just, just sell him rubbish. Uh, that, noble go that nobleman would uh, see BS if, if he came across BS. Um, and on uh, the Rostock manuscript, um, we have a dedication to another count, von Everstein und Neugard. Uh, this guy was, um, uh, again, uh, it's interesting researching this, these people because the names sometimes are there. Sometimes they're just mentioned by their first name or their second name or name of their cousin for some reason. I don't know what. Um, and I must say that uh, thank you to Google Books and uh, the, the digitalized uh, sources from the 19th century because I think that a lot of archives um, have also been destroyed in the passage of times uh, the last occasion in the Second World War mm -hmm. uh, because of the bombardments and then so on and so forth. So we have something to work with but uh, we need full-time researchers to actually see it through. So this lawyer I mean, I can't call him lawyer. He was a legal professional and a diplomat. And interesting, he worked for Duke von Württemberg, 
who like knightly games. So and we have uh, again we have the reformed warlike uh, uh, nobility and he also worked for the Archbishop Elector of Cologne. Uh, the Arch he was one of the seven people who elected the Roman King who became the Emperor. Okay, so we have this super delegate, super electorate. Yeah, uh, of course, because he was an Archbishop, he was a Catholic, but uh, he turned Calvinist and triggered a war, a civil war in Cologne, because he just wanted to stay in Cologne and be a Calvinist bishop in a way. Well, they chased him out, and then he became uh, a canon and deacon in Strasbourg, Maya's town, in the 1570s. So, war, 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 war. And then uh, this uh, missing uh, a treatise that um, I read about it on the, on the blog, on the Talhofer blog, by Jens Peter, uh, he mentioned that this mis missing treatise was dedicated to Count von Veldens, Count Palatine. Uh, this guy actually married a uh, daughter of Gustav I of Sweden uh, in, the, in the 60s, uh, 1560s. But what is interesting about this particular Protestant Calvinist is that he built a town, Falsburg, which is just about 40 kilometers northwest from Strasbourg. He populated it with Protestants from Lorraine. Lorraine at that time is the domain of the French king. So he gets the Protestants out of Lorraine, out of the uh, domain of a Catholic king, puts them in the town. But later on in the 80s, he um, b went bankrupt and, and sold that particular town and half of his county. So he um, <laughs> actually just squandered his Protestants away. So, <laughs> so on and so on. So we see that just these people, this list is brimful of Calvinists who are in this or another way connected to war. And finally, uh, Maya's employer that I mentioned before, the Duke of uh, von Mecklenburg, Schwerin, this guy is a godfather in this particular sense. Yes, uh, Corleone in this way. He is an authority. He, this guy fought for the emperor in the Schmalkalden Wars, you know, the 1540s league that I mentioned earlier. Uh, even though he's a Lutheran, he fights for the emperor. His father asked him to because of, you know, you're a part of the system, you're a part of the, you have a place within the empire, you fight for that place, regardless of your particular religion. But in the mid-century, there was another revolt of Protestant princes because things weren't going so well with the... Um, peace treaties and the things that uh, the empire still hoped to quench the Protestantism and, and make the empire, uh, empire Catholic again and uh, all those uh, incentives for the Protestant princes would just go. Uh, it's economy based and a chance of independence or, or at least more autonomy would go away so they revolted and then this Duke von Mecklenburg uh, goes over and, and fights against the emperor. Uh, in this time, this time, em Emperor Charles abdicates and his brother takes over, Ferdinand. And anyway, von Mecklenburg is another guy who has fought wars, who knows what it looks like, uh, and who is building a state. And he employs Maya, and he actually creates a anti-pole to the monopolist fencing guild of the time, the Marx Bruder. So Duke von Mecklenburg creates uh, another version of that guild. And Marx Bruder were Catholic. They were dedicated to Our Lady of da 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 da. Yeah. And then we have a Duke of Mecklenburg one who wants to have uh, another fencing guild. Uh, does it want to be a Protestant guild? I don't know. Uh, I don't have that information. I can't say. But he is there. And uh, this Duke also writes, he uh, writes about military about warfare, about technology, ballistics, and so on and so on. And he employed Maya. So you see, Maya, Maya's circle, again, dealt with war. He mentions that in his Grundliche Beschreibung about teaching for war. He, do, he never really says, I'm teaching you how to win in a sports tournament. Um, um, he delivers a proper sort of a uh, proper pr skill that a fighting person who would again fight for just moral cause and what is 
fighting for one's country than a just moral cause. Um, okay, just so what, just, just to summarize here what we've got, we've got Strasbourg which is a, a center of Calvinism. Um, he's surrounded by Calvinists and, and to be clear, Calvinists in Protestantism are, are those people who were not interested in working within the legal framework, framework of the empire as the, as the Lutherans were. Um, and you've got this, this document or series of documents which has possibly uh, what could be interpreted as allegories that are either pro or, or um, at least listing some elements of, of Calvinism and anti-Catholicism. Th th this sounds like it's leading to somewhere there. It sounds like we, we've got an individual who may be um, not just writing a, a fight book, but is actually propounding some sort of philosophy or, or even providing a certain set of individuals, maybe Calvinists, with a guidebook for fighting. Yes, is that, is some, that a fair assessment? And, and somebody employs him, you know, Maya build me an army and once Maya gets there he dies of common cold, yeah? Um, so yeah, if, if you want to write a, a, a thriller, a historical thriller, th thriller, there's, there's plenty of material. Now I just want to say that, um, again, it's very simplified. Uh, I don't want to say that Lutherans were not warlike. It's just that in some particular particular cases, they differed from the Calvinists. It was the the rise of 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 active Calvinism, and if you remember the French Huguenots, you see where that is leading. So you see that Calvinists were less prepared to compromise, and it was the time when again uh, the empire sort of uh, gave in to the Protestant Germany because they had uh, the Balkan Front and the Mediterranean to deal with. You've mentioned the cold several times and you sounded rather doubtful That's that he did yeah. he die of a cold. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, while, whilst we're getting into um, a little bit of Dan Brown, um, <laughs> would you like to offer a theory? Yes, well, perhaps. I mean, um, there are letters that say that, that, that when the, between the Duke of Mecklenburg, the Mice employer, and his widow, that, that was left in Strasbourg, and you know they say, oh yeah, Joachim died of, of cold, and then the widow said, well, can I have his books back then? Because Joachim took uh, this Grundliche Beschreibung, copies of his book, to, to be sold, and so he can then repay his loan. Um, and the Duke said, what books? The water destroyed them. So she never got any books back, as far as I know. So, yeah, so, again, we have this guy. He is, uh, he is, uh, uh, he is a firecracker in a martial sense. He's an asset to this uh, Duke who has political agenda, so on, so on. And then when things really start rolling, and then he, this guy dies of cold. Um, do I want to, am, am I, am I, am I trying to force an evidence, trying to say that Maya was assassinated to prevent the rise of a, of, of another Protestant strong state in the north, you know, um, I don't know, I mean, you know, a common cold, come on, you know, but then again, people have died from, from less, I guess, from mosquito bites. Stuff like that. It was certainly so, cold yeah, at the time, but Strasbourg, of course, becomes later on in the century the scene of um, quite a lot of controversy. Oh. Um, well, so yeah. So um, go on, I, say I it. Say the theory. Say it. Say it. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned cold. maybe he died. Maybe he died of cold and uh, uh, three feet of, of blade through his chest. I don't know. From behind, of course. Or, or, or something else. Is, but is, is, there anything that, is there anything that, that, that points to that? No, no. So I, 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 I can't prove that or I can't even hint to that. I, um, it, I, I really should um, uh, dedicate more time to, to, to that <laughs> research. Uh, people who've been to Strasbourg archives, uh, again, Olivier Dupuis, uh, as far as I know, he didn't come up with anything irregular other than the natural causes, uh, the sickness, the, the, the cold. Um, I'm just saying, maybe I'm just, I just want Maya to be a more of a 
hero, you know, more of a thing. Ah. You, well, you, you don't want to be him to die on a duff note, basically. You want him to go out on something mysterious. Perhaps, <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> so, I mean, I think that what I just want to touch on to, to perhaps finish this, and I don't know if you've got a whole thoughts on his hands, is there are going to be a lot of people who will, will listen to this to go, well, yeah, but I'm just interested in sort of learning the techniques and and smacking my opponent or being a better fencer than my opponent. So what we've got here is obviously an extremely rich history surrounding the tree ties. Um, how important is that for the modern practitioner? Well, to be honest, if someone was uh, was keen, is keen on uh, training hard, uh, training to the best of their ability uh, for the aim of being a good fencer at I don't know, maybe a sport event or just any martial event. History may not be so important in one case, that this person already knows why they're doing it in the way they want it to be done. But, for example, if uh, you do this martial, historical martial arts that you implement, which you, that you invite in your own uh, time and place, um, this historical background may help you get in touch with a person from the 16th century and maybe you find out if you have a similar intention. And I'm not talking about a war. I'm not, I mean, they were not, not everybody was, was, was uh, war crazy, okay? We are not training to go after our neighbors because they're Protestants. What I'm saying is just the attitude to the fighting. For the Maya, for example, Regardless of the historical context or not, if people just learn how to deliver what they have to deliver and then get out of the distance, that would be perfect, yeah? The historical framework is there to help the person. It's not necessarily there to help you with the art itself. So I can't tell you, you will be a better fencer if you go for the historical framework. I, I just tell you, you may have, you may find something that is fun, you may find more motivation, and maybe you can actually find out that you're not the first person who had probably the same thoughts about martial arts, and you know, you just connect. Uh, the martial arts is never about one person. We are many, many people in one flow, in a way, and this is where it trans transcends the historical age, it transcends the period. This is why, for example, when we meet and we spar, we are doing a historical martial art, but it's not historical anymore. We are doing it in our time. It's a contemporary thing. Okay, Roman, thank you very, very much for this. It was really, really insightful, I think. Um, do we have any more questions or did you say, Roman? No, I don't, but I've kind of got the feeling I'm going to be thinking about this for a, a long time. Roman, yeah. thank you for... Um, Thank you for helping us see beyond the pages of the book. Yeah. Thank really you good. very much. Thank you both. It was excellent chatting to you again and, and uh, seeing you uh, again. And thanks for the invitation. And I just hope that people who um, are still with us in a way that I wish them well and lots of fun with whatever martial aspect they're doing. It just, you know, be there, be friendly and long live HEMA. All right, Roman. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks, Bye. Take care, bye. bye.